Can you see it? We can yes. see it. Okay, all right. So um, why Nina, right? Uh, in addition to being open source and zero cost, um, there's a number of things that it really does well. It provides full equipment control for uh, almost all cameras, uh, including DSLRs, uh, which was one of the appealing things for me because I said I started out with a Canon DSLR. Um, most telescopes and mounts can connect to it. It supports filter wheels. It supports a myriad of electronic and automatic focusers. Uh, rotators, and one thing I really like is it supports a manual rotator. You can actually configure it to use a manual rotator and in the framing assistant, when you get your picture the way you want it, when it's doing plate solving, it'll tell you rotate your, your scope 60 degrees counterclockwise. And then it'll do another plate solve and see if you're right. And you can control how accurate you have to be. But that's actually been really nice, a nice feature. It supports switches. And I'm going to um, profess to be dumb here. I don't know what a switch is as it relates to astronomy and astrophotography. So I, I haven't figured that out. Um, also, it supports a number of different weather devices and systems. So you can get the ambient temperature and the humidity and that sort of stuff loaded into it. Uh, one of the other things that it also supports now is it has dome control. So one of the newer versions has got dome control and a number of other things with it. So um, it's, it's pretty robust. <clears throat> if you have any questions while I'm going through this, just ask or put them in the chat. Don't, don't feel like you're interrupting me. Um, on the image recognition side with Nina, it'll actually calculate statistics for each frame you take and display it, uh, average bit depth and all that sort of thing. Um, it doesn't, you can set it up to do an automatic stretch so you can see your data as it's being captured. It uses star detection with a half flux radius calculation. And it also make exposure time recommendations. It's got an exposure wizard that you can run before you start on your object and it'll recommend uh, the best exposure time based on the object in the sky conditions that you're in. I haven't used that a lot. I've played with it a little bit and it seems to work, but it's something that I haven't, I haven't really had much uh, need for because I tend to run my camera at Unity Gain. Uh, and um, also I, did, I just do kind of standard, you know, 30 second, one minute, five minute exposures. Um, for sequencing, the sequencing engine uh, recently had a major upgrade and I, I'm not as intimately familiar with all of its features. I'm going to show it to you later and show you some of the new stuff that they've done with it, but it's much more, much more customizable and much more complex than it was originally. Uh, setting up a simple sequence, if you just want to get out and shoot, is very easy and I'll show you how to do that. Um, it, it, it literally, if you know what object you want to go for, you can get a sequence set up in just a, a couple of minutes and be imaging right after that. Most of the time, that's what I do. But you can set up multiple targets for a sequence. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the uh, North American Nebula that I did last summer. Uh, that was a four panel mosaic. And I, I set up each of the panels of that mosaic as a separate item in the sequencer. And it, it did, you know, the full set of 60 exposures of the first panel and then move to the second panel and move to the third panel. And I run out of light. And then the next day I restarted that sequence and it picked up right where it left off and did the last uh, panel and, and finished the run for me. So it's, it's pretty good that way. You can specify a number of things, including exposure times, the number of exposures, what filters you wanna take, whether you wanna dither, dither how many, how often you want to dither. You can say every frame, every two frames, every three frames. Uh, you can set the gain and um, the, uh, what's the other one, bias or something. There's a number of things and you'll see that too. Um, you can also, one of the things I really like about it is it's um, it's pretty robust with plate solving. It'll, it'll support about six or seven different plate solve tools. Uh, I'll, talk, I'll show you the one I use. The one I use the most is ASTAP. It's very, very fast and it's very, very reliable compared to Plate Solve 2. I never had any luck getting Plate Solve 2 to run right. ASTAP, once I installed it, it just ran right away and it'll Plate Solve a target typically in under 30 seconds for me. Uh, it's, it's pretty quick. Um, it also has a very um, flexible uh, automatic focus. So you can set different conditions and I'll show you that for autofocus. You can say at start of sequence, on filter change, 
you can say after X degrees of ambient temperature change, um, if HFR uh, increases by X percent, you know, for based on your original image and that sort of thing, and it'll run the focus routine. And the, the focuser is, is actually one of the really strong things of, about Nina. Uh, once I got it up and running, there's a lot of different options and I'll show you those. Um, you can like SGP, if you're familiar with that or Voyager, you can save your image files using dynamic names uh, and you know different sets of data. So you can put the exposure length and the object name and all that kind of stuff in your uh, file. You can also save the file as FITS or XISF files, uh, including, you know, they can, will save all the available header keywords and things like that, that you'd be used to seeing in an application. Uh, there's also a very good sky atlas in there. And I know some of you guys are probably used to seeing on a scope, they'll say go to with over 99,000 objects in there. You know, you really, nobody really uses that many objects on their go to scope, but uh, there's over 10,000 deep sky objects in the built in atlas in Nina. Um, you can filter the myriad ways to just get the objects that are relevant to you. Um, there's also altitude charts for your object based on your location that are available. Um, and a number of other things. I'll show you that in a minute. It also will integrate and can be run. You could use um, Cirque du Soleil or the Sky or any other number of uh, star atlases with it and feed Nina the output of those applications. And then the other, the other thing I like about it is the framing assistant. And I know SGP has got one here. There's, a, there's a, a number of different sky surveys you can use to pull the data for for framing and I'll show those to you. Um, I tend to use the same one because I found it, they, they vary in speed. Some of them for some reason take a long time to download the object, the, the image. Uh, other ones are quicker. Um, you can get a nice preview of your field of view. Uh, you can drag the preview around for precise, precise position. So I told, mentioned you can rotate it, you can drag it around where you want it. And there's also an offline sky map, which is nice if you're not connected to the internet which contains all the sky atlas, deep sky objects, constellations, coordinate grid lines uh, to allow you to choose a target and frame it when you're offline. So that's handy too. Usually what I do when I'm, when I'm away from the internet, I will, I will create my sequences and save them as a file when I'm connected to the internet and then just load them when I get to the field. I, do, I typically won't be doing it if I'm not connected to the internet, but it is an option. So um, that said, that's kind of the end of the presentation. Like I said, it was just a real short overview about a couple of things I wanted to uh, get to. I'm gonna close that and let me share my internet browser now. So um, any questions before I move on? Okay, <clears throat> so to find Nina, it's available online at nighttime-imaging.eu. Uh, this is the website. If you just Google Nina, you'll find it, but make sure you put the period in between each letter. Um, it stands for Nighttime Imaging and Astronomy. The webpage is pretty good to go, go to here. A couple things that are very, um, I think, kind of important to this. Uh, the download section is where you would download the different apps. So there's a number of things that you need to get. One, if you're using an X64 architecture, uh, and 64-bit drivers, all your ASCOM drivers need to be 64-bit as well or they won't work. So the 64-bit version in Nina will not work with 32-bit with drivers. You've got to have 64-bit drivers. If you don't have 64-bit uh, drivers for your equipment, you got to use the 32-bit version. So there's the latest stable releases right here in both versions. And then you get down into the nightly builds and they literally... Uh, you'll get a new nightly build every couple of days if you set it to just download. Um, they contain all the latest development snapshots, so any enhancements, bug fixes in that that haven't been put into the officially released version are available here. And again, you know, I've never had any problems with them, but I do know of people who've installed the nightlies and had problems, and you've had to back them out or uninstall and reinstall to get it cleaned up but they also have a 64-bit and a 32-bit version of that. In addition to the downloads, one thing that I strongly recommend anyone installing Nina download 
is the Sky Atlas Image Repository. So it's about a gigabyte, but it's basically a little image of all of the Sky Atlas objects. So when you're offline, it'll show you a picture in your display when you load, load images from there. Uh, it, it takes up a gig of space. Nowadays, that's not that much, but it's something that you want to consider downloading. Additionally, hey Jim, yeah. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, when, uh, when you said uh, you need to use 64-bit uh, ASCOM drivers, um, does the ASCOM diagnostics, when you open that up, uh, I don't remember ever seeing any information about whether it's 32-bit or 64 bits on a driver? Um, you know, that's a good question. I've actually never used the ASCOM diagnostics tool. So what I did when I, when I downloaded the 64-bit version of Nina was I went to my manufacturer sites and downloaded the ASCOM drivers for my stuff and they designated 32 bit and 64 bit for most of them. Okay, so you didn't you didn't download from the ASCOM site itself. No, I I, I like my ZWO cameras, I got the ZWO drivers. Okay. And for my mount I went and got the the, the AZ, uh, EQ mod because I, I have a Skywatcher AZ EQ5 mount. Okay. And that's EQ mod and there's a 64 bit and a 32 bit version of that. Uh, just that, that kind of thing. You just have to watch that. Um, I do know that most of the manufacturers and most of them will, will provide you 64-bit version or 32-bit version. Mm, okay. You're seeing a lot more 64-bit than you did in the past because most all the new machines are 64-bit. Okay, so a couple other things that you need to make sure you do um, before you install Nina. Make sure you have all the drivers installed for all of your hardware. So your mount, filter wheel, focuser, camera, uh, dome, any other kinds of things that you need. Make sure you've got those, those downloaded to your computer. They're installed and they're functional and you see them in the system manager. If you don't, then you might have problems connecting to some of that equipment once you get in. But that's kind of important. Um, so that's a download section. Um, Nina also, there's a link to their Discord site here. Uh, that's for support. They also have really good documentation online. I'm just going to show you this because I think it's it's important. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a number of good websites that are dedicated to getting started with Nina. And there's also a good document in here about that, but they have on their documentation site, both, um, I wanna, sorry, let me go back one more. So when you look at documentation, there's the release documentation and they also do documentation for the nightlies. So the latest version of the doc, the, the things that have changed from the main release they will document in that nightly documentation and you can read about it. So that's really actually kind of nice because I don't know many software packages that one, make beta versions just generally available to their users and two, that take the time to document all the changes in the, in the beta versions of the software so you can understand what they're doing. So I'm gonna take you to the, um, to the uh, getting, getting the main release uh, documentation it's pretty well organized. It's break, it breaks out into sections, talks about, you know, there's requirements um, and here's the recommended software. It kind of tells you, you know, you need to ask com 6.4 framework. You need PH2 guiding. If you're gonna be guiding with PHD2, uh, any of several supported plate solving apps, ASTAP is absolutely the best. I strongly recommend it if you haven't tried it, get it and try it. It can use all sky plate solve. It, it can use a local astronometry, not net, and plate solve too. It can also use, you know, cart to sail, H and sky, Stellarium the sky uh, for planetarium. And then it talks about supported devices. So um, direct camera support. And this is where the drivers things come in, Dennis. Uh, for my ZWO cameras, they're supported. It directly supports Canon, Nikon, QHY, um, and others. Other, other cameras. Um, are supported through ASCOM drivers. So if these here will actually use the native vendor drivers um, and it gets into ASCOM device support. And again, it supports cameras, mounts, filter wheels, focusers, just about anything you have. But again, if it's a 32-bit only driver, it won't work with the 64-bit version in Nina. Uh, then there's, just to give you a little bit more, here's some of the tabs in Nina. You'll see that it kind of gets into each one if you want to see info on the equipment tab for the camera. You can click on it, it jumps right to it and it shows you 
you know, everything you need to know about that uh, and so on and so forth. It's, it's good documentation, makes it easy to find things and relatively easy to get set up. So, so Jim, uh, not to get stuck on these drivers because they have, they have pinched me in the butt so many times. Um, no. What about if you're a mixed bag? So if, if you've got, can you mix 32-bit and 64-bit drivers if you use the 32-bit version of Nina? I have not tried it, but I do not believe that would work. Okay. I don't think a 64-bit driver will work with the 32-bit uh, application. You can, some 64-bit some applications will work with 32-bit drivers, but it's usually not the other way around. Right, okay. So um, one other quick thing I just want to let you know is in the documentation, they've got this quick start section under advanced uh, down here. And in here, this is where, where I started. When I, when I first got it, I went to the quick start and I followed through this. It'll walk you through an overview of the AI, how to connect all your equipment, how to finalize the settings, how to focus, how to start a sequence and get going. It's, it's basic, but you can, you can get going in just a, you know, a couple of hours with that. And there's actually, in addition to here, there's a little arrow you can just click to go to the next page and it'll walk you through it. So that's really all I wanted to show you guys on the website. And I apologize if it's an eye chart. I didn't think about that when I was doing this online with Zoom, but um, I'm going to now uh, bring up my, the, the mini PC that's connected to my system in the garage and we'll, we'll open Nina and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on every tab and every option in the system and show it to you. Uh, and I'll talk to you about how I do things. So this is my mini PC. It's connected to my telescope out in the garage. Uh, the first thing I always do before I get started with Nina is I, I run EQ Mod, which launches EQ, the EQ ASCOM toolbox, which connects to my mount. So it allows the mount to talk to Nina. So um, you can do the, the driver setup and that's relatively, all right, what are you doing there? Oh, it's, it's not gonna, it's gonna crud out on me, isn't it? What is it saying? Application is busy. Hang on a second, sorry about that. Let me just get rid of that. What is going on? Hang on, I'm gonna stop my share and see if I can clear this up, sorry. Sorry about this, guys. <clears throat> I apologize. So when I, when I launch my EQ toolbox, I click connect and it connects to my mount. And right now you can see that the mount is parked and you know, that's pure side, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the next thing I, you have to do is I typically will launch Nino. <clears throat> Minimize these. Or we're gonna assume I already did my polar alignment and all that sort of thing. So the first thing Nina asks you to ask you about when you bring it up is it asks you uh, what profile do you want to use? You can have multiple profiles for different equipment. And uh, the, my default profile has no filter wheel, because I don't have one. I have a filter drawer. Uh, the ASI 294 camera, my EAF, ZWO EAF focuser, EQ mod telescope, which is connected to my Skywatcher. And it shows the focal length of the telescope. And you can actually tell it to say, if you, if you don't change scopes and other equipment, you can tell it to save that profile and don't ask me again next time, which is what I'll do there. And I'll just say low profile. 
So the next thing that happens here, and I'm gonna expand this, I've got a screen sharing bar at the top that kind of gets in my way. So I'm gonna try to expand this as much as I can. Normally I would just take it full frame, but I'm gonna expand it up so that I'm not cut off at the top of that bar. Um, the first thing you're gonna see is the equipment tab. And you can see here that you know it has camera, um, a filter wheel, focuser, rotator, telescope, guider, switch, flat panel, weather, dome, and safety monitor. That's a new addition. So if you have a rain gauge or something like that or excess wind gauge and you want to trigger a shut everything down or park the scope if certain conditions exist, you can configure that. But you know, on the camera tab, you select your hardware from here. And you can see the different cameras I have. There's a simulator. Uh, if you have a DSLR connected, it'll show in here. My main imaging camera is the 294 MC Pro. So I'm going to click on that. Uh, if it's missing, you can scan for the device. And then to connect, you can click this button. There is an option in Nina to click here and connect everything. I don't do that because I don't like how it handles when PHD2 connects if you're not ready to start imaging. So I leave PHD2 disconnected until right before I'm ready to start imaging and then I connect it. And then Nina will manage starting and stopping guiding as, as the sequence runs pretty easily. So I'm gonna click connect on the camera. <clears throat> and you'll notice in the lower right corner, it says camera connected and a bunch of more info shows up. So it shows you the sensor type, the camera, uh, the sensor size, so this is 4144 by 2822, uh, the pixel size, in the X and Y axis, what gain it's set for, what the offset is set for. You can configure a default gain and offset and USB limit here for the camera when you're using it. Like I said, I keep mine set at unity gain and default offset. I never had any reason to change the USB limit either. Um, on the right side here, you can see the temperature control. So this is where I can tell Nina, uh, cool me to 10 below ambient, which is what I usually do. And I also can set a minimum duration for that to occur. If I set that, imaging won't start, the sequences won't run until it attains the temperature that I set. But you can change that duration. And that's, that's because some cameras, if you cool them too fast, they'll get frost on the sensor. And I've, I've not had that problem, but I usually set it for 15 minutes just to make sure it doesn't cool too fast. When I'm ready to start, um, Tonight, I'm going to actually change that number. You can hit, hit there. You can actually just type. And I'm just, going to, I'm just going to change it down to like three, two minutes. And I'll make it four. And then click this to turn the cooler on and start cooling. You can also use this to warm the camera. So when you're done imaging, if you wanted to warm the camera back to ambient, you can tell it, take 15 minutes and warm the camera back up to ambient temperature. So I click that. And you'll notice that it turns into an X, the cooler checkbox up here checked. And now you'll see on these graphs, it'll give me a running total of my chip temperature on the bottom and the cooling power that's being used in the top graph. So I'm just gonna let that run. And I'm gonna go to the next item on the display, which is a filter wheel. If you have a filter wheel, you would configure it here. One of the cool things with filters in Nina is you can um, you can set focusing offsets for each filter. So uh, some, I'll just say most filters aren't par focal necessarily, and you might have to adjust, readjust focus for them. Well, with Nina, if you, you take the measurements, you can enter those offsets and avoid refocusing when you change filter. So it'll, if it's uh, at a hundred for your red filter and it's plus eight for green in your focus, you can set that offset and it'll automatically adjust the offset to match when it changes filters. Now, most of us would refocus anyway, but it is something that they can do. Like I said, I don't have a focus, a filter wheel, so I'm not gonna really um, be able to talk about it. I could show you a, a ASCOM simulator, but I don't even have that running. So we'll leave that alone. On the focuser, again, you select your hardware from the list here. It does uh, integrate with that Pegasus Astro Ultimate Power Box if you're using that for focus control. I think, Jeff, you have one of those. Um, or ASCOM focusers. I use the ZWO focuser. I use that driver. 
I can click this button to bring up the settings for the focuser in the native driver and make adjustments. So here's the native driver adjustments for, uh, for this. I'm not gonna putz with it because it's configured, but I can get there from here. Um, again, rescan devices, I'll show you ones that aren't there. To connect, you just click the connect button and you'll see down the lower right corner, focuser are connected. <clears throat> Once it's connected, it'll show you the name, the description, if it's moving or settling, what the maximum increment is, the maximum step, the current position, if you have temperature compensation turned on or off, if there's a temperature probe, which mine does have, it'll show you the current temperature of that probe and target position. So I can actually move the focuser from here if I wanted to. Uh, I'm not going to, but you can enter the target position here and click move, or you can use these um, and th this will move by uh, five times the autofocus step size, and this will move half the autofocus step size. And I'll, I'll show you that when I, where that's set up as we get into the options. Uh, rotator, it supports um, any number of uh, ASCOM uh, certified or ASCOM supported rotators, or my favorite, the manual rotator. Um, oddly enough, it, it's your hands. You do have to connect it. <laughs> so you have to click connect and it connects with the manual rotator. That just lets Nina know you have a, you have a rotator connected and you want to use it. Like I said, with the manual, if rotation is needed, it just pops up during your plate solve and says, rotate the scope 60 degrees clockwise. And you adjust it and it'll do another plate solve. And if you're off more than your tolerance, it'll prompt you to adjust it again. Uh, I was very, 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 very excited the first time I got it in the first crack because my scope uh, rotator doesn't have degrees on it. So you have to kind of guess. <clears throat> but anyway, um, that's what that that's where that is. And then if you have a automatic focuser, you can target a manual position as well and, and move it there. Uh, on the scope side, this is where you connect to your mount. Um, I, I kind of wish it said mount instead of telescope, but I understand why it says that. Uh, again, you pick your system from here. I have the EQ mod HEQ5 or 6. You can get into the settings right here. Um, and to connect, you just click that connect button. And it'll tell you scope is connected. Once you're connected to your mount, it'll show you uh, your latitude and longitude that you're connected to, the elevation, said real time, the how long to the meridian flip, uh, where it's pointed in right ascension and declination, what side of the pier it's on, whether it's tracking. Uh, you can manually input coordinates here to go to for RA and deck. So I can, I can slew it to a specific point in the sky. That's really handy for doing calibration in PhD two, or if you wanna, um, you know, test focus somewhere on a bright star or something like that. Although there's many other ways to get there in Nina. You also have manual control here. So you can adjust the tracking rate. Do you want to track a said real rate? Uh, you can plus and minus the rate here. I can slew north, south, east, west, stop. I can also park and unpark the scope here. So I'm going to click unpark to unpark the scope just to make sure that it, it'll talk to me and work the way I'd expect it to. Under guider, uh, again, PhD2 is supported. It also supports no guider, direct guider, meta guide, and then these Lacerda super guider and auto guider options. Um, I've always used PhD2, it works pretty well. Um, have never had any issues. On this screen, it'll show if it's connected or not. And it'll also show you your, your grid here, the graph that many of you are familiar with. I'm gonna go ahead and connect here just for fun to show you what that does. So once I'm, once I'm connected, you can see it launches PhD2. It's gonna fail miserably because the scope is covered and it's in my garage. But um, <clears throat> I will go ahead and, and minimize that. You can see here, I can tell it how many, if I set dither, how many pixels I want it to move for each dither, whether I want to dither in RA only, some people do that. You can uh, set a subtle pixel tolerance, minimum settle time so that after a dither, what the minimum time it'll wait before it starts imaging or trying to uh, plate solve. The settle timeout, uh, do you wanna retry starting, auto recover guiding if it reports um, that it failed? 
Um, and then there's also a guiding timeout and an ROI percentage to find the guide scar. One of the other nice things about Nina, and many other apps have obviously, if you hover over one of these, it actually pops up a little box that tells you what, what it's for. So here it's the percentage of the frame to be considered for finding a guide star measured from the center of the frame. And then here again would be the, the diagram for guiding. Um, switch, yeah, like I said, I'm not exactly sure what this is. Uh, Eagle makes one ultimate power box. I think it has to do with power switches, uh, on off switches for equipment, but I, I don't know. I, I haven't used them and know if you do, it's there to support you. Um, you can also uh, set up a flat panel. So if you have uh, one of these uh, all pro spike a flat or flip flat or an all neck flat panel or something like flat master, you can configure that in here and that will work fully integrated with one of the coolest things of Zeno, Nina, the flat wizard. Um, it's got a really cool flat wizard built into it that helps you get flats done. Uh, weather, this one's pretty simple. You just pick your weather source. You can use uh, APIs for weather underground, open weather, that sort of thing. You can get weather data from Pegasus Astro's power box and it'll show it in the display when you're doing things. Uh, dome control, again, you can pick different domes. I don't have one configured. I don't have a dome, so there's nothing there. But um, it does allow you to uh, manage the dome, open the dome, close the shutter, move the dome, synchronize it with your telescope mount, and all that stuff right from inside Nina. <clears throat> and then the safety monitor is new, and the, the dome is also newer. Uh, safety monitors are like the, I don't have one, but um, I assume it has to do with like, if my dome is open and I'm imaging and it starts to rain, you detect rain, park the scope and close the dome, you know, that kind of thing. If the wind exceeds X, if you're trying to move the dome and it stops moving and it's stuck, stop what you're doing and, you know, exit out, I guess. Uh, so that's the equipment tab. Any questions? <clears throat> okay, I'll take that as a no. Um, well, well, uh, yeah, one question, Jim. You were you were kind of just giving us a tour, right? But your profile for a session has all those pull downs pre yeah. pre selected, yeah. right? Yes. So I set everything and then I save my profile. So right. when you're when you're there and you load the profile, you don't have to go through here. I right. wanted you to see what was in the app. So that was why I did this manually like this. Um, Sky Atlas is the next option. So this is this is where I start in a planning session for, for Nina. As you can see here, uh, there's a box up here where you can type an object name in, uh, M42, M31, whatever you want to go to, you can type there. It takes NGC objects as well. Uh, you can also filter by specific types. So if I only wanted to see globular clusters in the constellation, um, I don't know, is there one that's got good, let's say Hercules, because I know there's one there. I can do this, I can hit search, and it'll bring up all the globular clusters that are part of the constellation Hercules. You can see there's actually four of them, I didn't know that. So it'll bring them up and you can see right from here, when you get your objects oriented, you figure out which one you want to go after. It shows you the, the altitude of the object, you know, now, so right now it's below the horizon. The blue line would indicate where it is. And I can add the target to a sequence. I can set it for the framing assistant or I can slew directly to that object from here. Um, what I'm gonna do, I guess it doesn't really matter. So let me just do this. And we'll, we'll say M13. Uh, before I move on, I'll show you also here, in addition to filtering by object type and constellation, you can enter specific coordinates if there's a spot in the sky you wanna go to. Um, if you want to only see things with an apparent surface brightness or an apparent size, apparent magnitude, a minimum altitude, or a reference date, uh, and you can select how they appear on here. You can sort them by size, magnitude, constellation, RA, surface brightness, etc. cetera. Um, and um, it also shows you down in this lower left corner a uh, little bit of info about the weather. So can see the moon is going to be at 7.57 percent. Moonrise is at 5:49 a.m. Um, dawn is at 4:36. Sunrise, sunset, dusk, that kind of thing. Um, but from here, once you find your object, 
And usually what I do with it is I don't filter by constellation or object type. I just type in what I'm going after. But once, once it shows up here, the next thing I always do is I set for framing assistant because I want to I want to frame it in my in my uh, my frame. So you set for framing assistant, and it'll jump you back into the framing assistant. So that's the next icon down. Here's where you pick your image source for the framing assistant. Now I told you there are several um, sources. The Hips Two Fits Sky Survey is the fastest, but from here I can also load a file. So if I wanted to uh, bring up a file of like, M4, I imaged M42 on Friday night, I think Friday or Saturday night, this last weekend, I could load one of those lights in here and then set that for my target and it would go exactly to where I was on Saturday if I wanted to take more images of the same, same object in the same orientation. Uh, otherwise you, you pick this HIPS2 sky survey, uh, it tells you what you're going after and then you have to click load image. And this, <clears throat> This will take a second. It initially always shows up way bigger than the window. So I click this button here. There's a, a plus, zoom in, zoom out, fit image to area, scale it one to one. Uh, I'm gonna fit the image to area and there it goes. So now I'm here, I can actually zoom in a little bit and see. Now, what Nina did when I'm here is here's the cluster. Um, and this little box around it represents my camera frame. So it took this, the specs from the camera and it created a box and the focal length of the scope and it created an actual, this is what it's gonna look like when you take this picture and what'll be in the frame. Now here I can, dra I can drag this around and set it to anywhere I want. Let's say there's something interesting in the lower left corner and I wanted to capture that and you know the, the cluster or there's multiple objects or uh, you're doing the Eagle Nebula or something like that and you want it to be, you know, at an angle in your frame or something, you can move it around. So once I get there, there's also um, <clears throat> down below here, uh, rotation. So what I can do is I can click this and I can rotate that image. And this is where the manual rotator comes in handy. I can set the, the perspective on that the way I want it. And then when I, when I do the plate solve, it'll actually not only center that object in the frame, but set the orientation that way and tell me how far I have to rotate it in either direction to get there. Um, this section here just got the camera parameters. Those are loaded automatically from your camera and telescope. Uh, when I get into the, um, the options, it's important that that focal length and that sort of thing be set correctly or this will be inaccurate. This next section here says horizontal panels and vertical panels. What I'm going to do real quick is I want to jump back and I'm going to clear this. And I'm going to clear the object types. And I'm going to go to uh, M42. <clears throat> and I'm only going to do this because it's big. So come back to the framing. I'm going to load that image. Uh, here it is. This is M42. Uh, you can zoom out, you can see, you know, here's the horse head and everything else. But um, in this, uh, let's just say, you know, that's a pretty big object. And I, I can rotate this. And I did this the other day. I rotated it so I could get it all in there. But we all know there's a lot of stuff, you know, around here that you also might want to capture. So you might want to do a mosaic. The way you do a mosaic in here is these horizontal panels. I can tell it how many horizontal panels I want to run and how many vertical panels I want to run and just by clicking that. And it'll do that and then it treats this as one frame. And I can rotate and, and you know, move around. I can move, move this over. I can move the, the image up a little bit. I can actually uh, drag this the way I want it. I want to get the horse head and Orion in here. I can, I can frame it the way I want. And when I'm done and I, and I add my target to target list or add the target to the sequence, it'll actually create a panel now. And this is a huge one, 16 panels, but you can adjust those, right? So that when I did that mosaic of the North American Nebula, I did four and I did it just like this. But it's, it's really easy to generate a mosaic in Nina. I think it's, I've never seen anything easier. You can set the overlap percentage here 
as well. Uh, if you want it overlap by 20%, which works really good, you can set it for more or less. <clears throat> the other buttons down here, when I'm in the framing assistant, down at the bottom, here's that, art, that horizon again. It shows you where your object is now uh, in, its, in its thing. I can see it's well above the horizon. It's past the meridian and it's, it's moving its way across. Um, I can slew to the target from here. I can recenter the image from here. I can add the target to the sequence. I can add it to a target list. Um, and what I want to do is I'm going to add the target list. And you notice when I click on that, it goes to either simple sequence or sequencer. So base the sequence target. The sequencer is the new one. It's, it's much more powerful. And I'm going to, I'll show you that in a minute, but I'm going to add this as a simple sequence here. And it's just, here's the sequencer. It's there. For now, just ignore it. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to it. So additionally, Nina's got this flat wizard. It's really slick. It works with integrated flat panels as well as manual flat panels. You tell it how many flats you want to take, how many dark flats you want to take, binning, gain. Um, you can uh, set the minimum exposure time. So for my camera, minimum exposure, it has to be three seconds. It doesn't like really super short flats. They don't work well. So they all have to be between three and five seconds long. So I can set a three second minimum, a uh, five second maximum um, flat step size. That'll be how many, how many uh, stops between each exposure will it take in that range. I can set the histogram mean target. So if I want it to be 29,000, I set it there. Set the mean tolerance. So it's a 10%, 20%, 15% of that target. And then I click go. And it'll actually take the flat, it'll analyze the flat. And if it's off, it'll adjust the exposure until it finds one that works. If it can't, it'll tell me that and say, based on your parameters, I can't take good flats for you. And you have to either you know, add another t-shirt layer because it's too bright or take something off because it's too dark or, or turn up the brightness on your flat panel or something like that. But it works really well and I, I use it all the time. <clears throat> um, the sequencer panel we talked about then there's an imaging panel and options. I'm going to talk about the sequencer here real quick. Um, as you can see, this is what they call the simple sequencer. So when I added the target to the sequence, you can see up here at the top, it added it. If I were to add another target to this, it would just show up as another line up there. But because there's only one, uh, in here, you can set a delay start. You can tell it whether you want to do one after another or loop. What that does is if you have multiple uh, filters, multiple exposures, and you know you don't think you're going to get it all done in a night, you can loop it and it'll do one and move to the next and do one and move to the next and do one. Or it'll do all of what's here and then move to the next filter and do all of those or the next exposure length and do all of those and just move on. You can tell it to start or stop guiding when you start the sequence. You tell it to slew to the target, which I always turn on. Center target means plate solve it and center it the way you've got it in the framing. A uh, rotate target tells you to rotate it to match the framing wizard. Um, it'll give you an estimated start time and finish time based on what you have here. Um, over on the right, it shows you the name of your object, the RA declination, your rotation that's set. And again, there's that little map. There is a way to add an artificial horizon to this. But you need you need one of those files that's got um, you know the altitude based on every degree of bearing around you, and I, I don't have one of those, so I haven't loaded that yet. I've been looking for an app to do that. There's there's apps you can use a camera, and and it'll actually like you just take a picture or a video and go 360 degrees, and it'll automatically set all that for you in a file. I haven't done that yet. Autofocus here. This is a really cool section. This is where you can control all the things with autofocus. So you can tell it to focus on start. I usually tell it on start. On filter change, I don't have a filter wheel, so it's not applicable to me. Um, after a certain amount of time passes, <clears throat> and then you set that time here. After a certain number of exposures, and you set that here. After a temperature change, I usually say on, and if it changes more than five degrees or two degrees, you can change that to whatever you want. Uh, after an HFR increase of 10%, I usually change that to five. Um, and then down here is where you set your exposure times and all that. So this first row is enabled. Uh, it shows you the current progress, the total number of frames. So you double click there, 
if you want to do 30 frames of um, 300 seconds, let's just say um, you type that in there. And here you can say whether it's a light, a flat, a dark. If you have flat, a flat panel integrated and you have it set up, you can actually just have it do the flats automatically for you. It'll, it'll you know, do that bias, dark, flat, snapshots. Um, filters, if there's filters, you can set it there. You can set your binning. You can turn dithering on. You can tell it how often to dither. Um, I usually don't dither every frame, I, if I'm depending on how many I'm taking. But I'll usually personally do two every every two or three frames. I find that's enough to get rid of the walking noise if I'm taking, usually taking 30 to 60 images or frames at a time in a session. And that's usually more than enough. That's a personal choice. And then you can set gain and offset. If I wanted to add another row of, to here to do, because um, I'm doing Orion, I want to get you know 30 really good deep frames and I want to get another 30 really, really short frames to capture the trapezium. I can click this little plus sign here and it'll add a new row. And again, it copies the previous row. All I got to do is change the time to say, um, let's make them 60 seconds, which even that's probably too long. They'll still wash out those stars, but it'll, it'll, it'll give you that. And you can, again, say to dither every X frames and adjust all that. Now, when I, when I um, down here at the bottom, it'll, you can also set it to cool your camera when the sequence starts. This is handy if you're setting up an, a sequence and you want it to run, you know, six hours from now and you're not going to be around, your, your system is just sitting out in the yard or whatever. You can tell it to unpark the mount when the sequence starts, so it'll unpark it when it starts. And you can also tell auto meridian flip. I will tell you this, the auto meridian flip with Nina works flawlessly. I have never had a single instance where it didn't function uh, on me. It, it, it works really good. It brings up a banner, it warns you it's coming, and it does the flip. It re-plate solves, re-centers, refocuses, and starts starts the, the imaging. It's very, very well done. You can also set end of last target options. And basically in this one, you can tell it to warm the camera or park them out when the sequence ends. You can save your um, sequence if you do it in advance. You can load them remotely. It's an XML file. Gabe, I think I sent you some. Uh, and then you can also um, save just your, uh, your image your object specs up at the top to load later if you wanted to load them again. Um, and then to start the sequence, you just click that button. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to get into that. And what it'll do here is it'll it'll um, slew to the target, plate solve, center, rotate, autofocus after plate solves, and then start the image and ter after turns on guiding. Um, in the imaging tab, this is where all the magic happens. There's a lot of things here. So um, basically these icons across the top represent these different sections. This is my configuration. What I have here is I show my camera stuff here and it'll show me the status of whether it's cooling or warming. Here you can see my chip temperature and the cooler power and whether it's on or not. Um, and then there's another tab here for my, for my focuser and that'll show me whether it's moving the current position I can move it manually if I want to. That's handy if you're trying to focus on something manually and not autofocus. Um, down here, I got a section for the rotator. So obviously mine's a manual rotator, so it's not really that helpful. And the telescope, and it shows me kind of where the merid meridian, how long to the meridian, how long to the meridian flip, uh, right ascension, declination, azimuth, what side of the pier it's on and all that. Um, here in the center is really kind of the heart of it. You've got your standard controls, you know, zoom up, down, fit image to area, one to one. Uh, there's also an option to toggle crosshairs, turn on or off auto stretch, uh, configure the detect and show the HFR, the stars in your image. There's a Batnoff analyzer. So if you have a Batnoff mask and you want to focus, you can use that to, to you can use this to do that. And then there's also a subsampling frame where you can create a a small image and um, subsample it and only download that area. Um, additionally, there's a bunch of other tabs I have here. Image history, that's self-explanatory. It's just a, a little thumbnail of every image it took all night. There's a manual focus target. So if you use a Batnoff mask or something, 
there's just a list of bright stars here you can just pick and go and it'll slew right to it uh, and then you can use your batten off mask dennis i added this for you there's a dome uh tab that they added and this shows you whether it's connected the shutter status driver can follow if, whether the system set to set the shutter to park it set the azimuth sync the azimuth park it find home uh etc that's all beyond me because i don't have a dome so uh, that's there there's a plate solving tab with where you can actually tell it to sync or reslew to the target here's where you set your your plate solve error i've got mine set to two arc minutes that might be too much for you you can set it smaller or larger you can set your exposure time for plate solving the filter you want to use binning and gain and then you, you click there and then down here it'll show you the status, you know, the time it took, whether it was successful, the RA deck it measured, the error distance, et cetera. Um, and then the last one is the statistics tab. The statistics it shows, there's a little graph here that shows you an H, uh, uh, um, histogram diagram of your image. And then it'll show you up here the width, the height, the mean, the standard deviation, the median, the MAD, the minimum number of stars and maximum number of stars. Uh, the HFR, the bit depth, and the gain. So it's it's interesting stuff there. On the right, um, there's an imaging section. So you can, I'm sorry, did somebody ask a question? Okay, um, almost done. So imaging section, uh, there's exposure. This is where you can actually manually take images with the camera. And then here, there's a sequence tab that shows you the status of your sequence. You know which which one you're doing, how many you've done, and there's an HFR history graph that'll show you your HFR history. Uh, and then there's there's a few other things up here um, that are kind of cool. There's the optimal exposure calculator. So I, I think I show I told you about that. Let me see if I can bring it up. Here's the exposure calculator. So what you need to do is it suggests an exposure time based on read noise and average sky glow. You set the exposure time, you tell it what filter and gain. It will use the sharp cap sensor analysis file if you've done one uh, to load it. You just enter your full well capacity, your read noise in E, your bias mean value. It'll calculate it if you don't know, and you run it and it'll give you a recommended exposure. Um, the, the, any questions about the imaging tab? Best thing to do is try to use it or come out to the club when I'm out there and you can see it in action. Then there's the options, and this is where you configure everything. So there's quite a bit here. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna just hit the high points. So this is all kind of um, color schema. It's got a um, a schema for nighttime. So right there, I can I can switch between night mode and day mode on with the click of a button. You can customize all the colors you want here, and then there's just some general stuff. You set your sky atlas directory here, your sky survey cache directory, level of log info and that sort of thing. Here's where you pick your auto update source. So Nina will auto update. If you want it to do nightlies, you would set this to nightlies. If you want betas, you do betas. If you want the releases, you do releases. Um, <clears throat> the next tab under options is equipment. Here's where you would set your, if it's wrong, you would, you would adjust your camera pixel size, bit depth, bear pattern uh, and that sort of thing, camera timeout, converter stuff. Your telescope, this is where you can specify what scope you have, what the focal length and the focal ratio is, a subtle time after slew. So how long do you wanna wait after a slew before you try to plate solve? Here's where you set your uh, weather stuff. You can set whether you use Fahrenheit temperatures, whether you wanna use Imperial units, and then you'd enter your weather map keys here if you you have one. Here's where you integrate your uh, planetarium software with the port and that, and it'll it'll load directly from the planetarium software in that framing assistant. And then here, this section here is where you set your filter wheel. So when you when you get your filter wheel set up, you tell it what position is what filter, and you set the offset in there. You can also, if you have a filter wheel connected import those directly from the filter wheel. <clears throat> Autofocus, there's quite a bit in here and I'm, I'm gonna um, just cover it relatively, but here you could tell it to use the filter wheel offsets. Your initial offset steps you set right here. The autofocus method, 
There's several that Nina uses. You can use a star HFR, or if you're imaging planets or the moon, or even uh, uh, Earth-based objects, you can set it for contrast detection. And it actually works really well. When I was, when I was um, trying to get my off-axis guider and the scope both focused at the same point, I used the contrast detection to focus on some trees down the block and it worked flawlessly. So a star HFR is what you want to send it. The AF curve fitting, there's several options there. You can use trend lines, parabolic, trends in parabolic, hyperbolic, or trends in hyperbolic. I found the trends in parabolic to work best. You can set the number of attempts. So if autofocus fails, how many times will it reattempt focus before it is either successful or moves back to the original position? You can tell it to limit focus to the brightest stars, like the, you know, or zero means no limit, so use all the stars. You can also set an inner and an outer crop ratio here. So what that does, when I before I had a flattener, the stars at the outside of my field were always curved. So what I did was I set a, a crop ratio and told it to only focus on the inner 60% of my frame and ignore everything on the outside. And that way my, my images were focused even though I had those comet shaped stars at the outside because I had a field because I didn't have a field flattener. You set the step size, the exposure time. You can tell it to enable or disable guiding during autofocus. Um, you can set a settle time, the number of frames per point. So for each focus point, you can have it do one, which I have it set for and then move on to the next. Or you can have it do two or three and average them. So you can get, if you really want an intense focus, you can do three exposures at each point and it'll average them together before it generates what the HFR was for that, for that frame. Um, there's that intercrop ratio. There's a backlash compensation method you can set. So uh, some focusers have a lot of backlash. The ZWO EAF is notorious for it. So I, I had to set my backlash compensation to overshoot. And then the backlash in and out I, I'm the, my best thing was to set it for zero and 250. So that tells it to move 250 steps before it starts measuring and starting the focus because there was that much backlash in it. I, I overshot it, so I have a bit of a flat tail on my focus curve, but it works really well, so I, I stick with it. Um, here's where you can set all your dome stuff, Dennis. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna go through this because I don't know anything about it. The imaging tab. Here's where you tell it to save your image as a TIFF, a FITS, or an XISF file. Um, I haven't actually tried XISF, but that's the PixInsight format, isn't it? So maybe maybe that might be better. I don't know. Um, and then here you can tell it your path, the file pattern, and it gives you all these different um, variables to use in your name. And it gives you a preview of what it looks like. You can do almost anything you want. Uh, there's a lot there. Here's where you set your auto meridian flip setting. So I tell mine to flip five minutes after the meridian, um, recenter it after the flip. In other words, run plate solve after the flip. How long to let it settle after the flip? Do you want to pause before the meridian? And should you auto focus after the flip? Um, imaging options. This is all kind of where you can set that auto stretch factor in the imaging tab. You can set that black clipping. You can set image annotations on or off. Debayer, whether you want to debayer the image, it doesn't affect the save file, but it'll affect what shows on the screen. I've never, I've, I've had it on and it works pretty well. Um, and there's some other things here I, I'm not going to get into. Then you, there's some sequence stuff. So you set your default folder for sequences and for your template. You're, you can also set a default template. So if you know every object you take, you're always going to do, you know, 30, 300 five minute images, you can set that up and set it as a, as a template and use it. Um, there's also a startup sequence template you can run um, and you can disable the simple sequencer, which I don't know why you do that. There's also an option here to reset the layout. So that imaging tab is very powerful. You can move this stuff around and put it where you want it, much like SGP and you can just kind of tell it where you want it to go. But if, if you screw something up and you can't find something or you can't get something back, you go to options and reset layout and it boom, resets everything to default. And then you can get back into it. Then the last thing here under options is plate solving. This is where you pick your plate solver. 
These are the ones that are available that work with this. Like I said, ASTAP works great. I actually set the plate solver and my blind solver for ASTAP. Um, and you can set your exposure time, the filter you want to use, binning, gain, pointing tolerance, rotation tolerance. You can see mine is set to two arc minutes for pointing and one degree for rotation. Um, <clears throat> how many attempts to use and how long the delay between attempts. Uh, and then there's specific settings. So for ASTAP, um, I have to tell it where the ASTAP file is, what my search radius should be, the down sample factor, and the maximum number of objects to use. There's similar settings for the other ones. So that's the options. And uh, that is pretty much the end of my discussion or presentation of Nina. Any questions, comments? For the group, I hope I hope it was helpful. <clears throat> I know there's a lot of SGP fans and uh, Voyager fans in the group, uh, but you know I would suggest if you're getting started in Im imaging or you're struggling with SGP or what you're using, give Nina a try. It works really good. It's very reliable and uh, you know it's free. You have nothing to lose. <clears throat> oh, I know what I was going to show you. I'm sorry. I was going to show you the advanced sequencer. So real quick, um, I'll go back to the sequence. The advanced sequencer is new and I'm not real familiar with it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click it. I'm gonna export this sequence to the advanced sequencer. And I'm just gonna show you kind of all the new stuff you can do. So the advanced sequencer is much more customizable. Um, again, it shows here on the left, this is kind of what's set in the sequence. You can nest instructions inside of each other. You can see for here, our target was the Orion Nebula. Um, you can set triggers, loop conditions, instructions. You know, just telling it to slew, center, rotate. Here's where it is, where it'll do the autofocus changes, the smart exposure. You know, here's my exposure times, light settings, darkness, and then closure. So that's a real simple one. But over here on the right, there are a couple things. There's a whole bunch of instruction sets for different devices you can load. There's templates and there's a basic parallel sequence startup, a basic sequence and basic sequence target. Uh, and then there's targets here. So if you wanted to save objects in here, uh, Gabe, this is kind of like your uh, saving um, future targets in Voyager. In Nina, I would go to that sky atlas <clears throat> and find an object and that could add it to the sequencer and it'll save them here. And then I can load them into a sequence. But the instructions here, there's a, a deep sky object sequence that you can have a parallel instruction set or a sequential instruction set. Uh, camera commands, you know, you can cool the camera, you can turn on and off the dew heater, set a readout mode, smart exposures, take exposures, take many exposures, you can warm the camera. On the dome, the things you can do are close the dome, synchronize the dome, open the dome, park the dome. Uh, filter wheel, you can switch filters and it tells you which one to switch. Um, for the flat devices, you can tell it to open or close the flat panel cover, set the brightness, toggle the light, uh, take the exposure. Here's all your different focuser settings. And the way this works, it's just drag and drop. So you can just drag it in there and it'll, it'll, it'll load. So you can, you can just, anything you wanna do, you can bring in here and, and just load it up and, and change it. For the guiding, you can tell to dither, dither after a number of exposures, start, stop guiding. <clears throat> Here's where it starts to get powerful. You can loop conditions for iterate, for a number of times, a specific length of time, until a specific time, while the altitude of an object is above or below a certain number of degrees above the horizon, while the moon is above or below a certain uh, illumination level or altitude. Uh, you can set your sun altitude, safety monitors. Um, on the telescope, you know, you can tell give it all your telescope commands. And then down here are some utilities. So there's annotations, you can set up, ex you can run an external script. So if you're in a Perl or Python or one of those things, you knew how to control your stuff with it. You can program a script and run it right from here. You can pop up message boxes. You can tell it to wait till an object is at a certain altitude or at a certain time of night. 
or for a specific time span or for the moon and sun if they're available or until they're above the horizon before you start something as a condition. Uh, so it's it's pretty powerful. I haven't played with it a lot. I, like I said, I'm, I'm a pretty simple guy. I don't have a real strenuous equipment set. And I, you know, when I'm gonna image, I just wanna get set up, get my target loaded and get going. So I just use the basic sequencer. But there's a, there's a lot of good videos online about this advanced sequencer. There's also um, good, good documentation on the website about it. And if it's something that interests you, you should be able to, to figure it out, especially if you're a programmer, because it uses a lot of the same kind of logic. All right, that's it, I promise. <clears throat> Any questions? That's pretty powerful, uh, Jim. Uh, you know, the the one thing that I liked uh, that I saw where you you get the object profile of where it is relative to sunrise, sunset, and its its altitude. Yeah, I mean yeah, that's it's... that's the same kind of functionality as in, in Telescopicus, and you know having that integrated into the into the sequence uh, that's that's uh, that's a pretty nice pretty nice feature. Yeah, there's there's yeah, there's a lot you can do. There's guys that are doing some pretty amazing stuff with that advanced sequencer. I I agree that that was and I get, I mentioned that to you too, Gabe, on your uh, your little project you're working on too. I think that's most one of the most powerful features to integrate. I wish SGP had that functionality, um, just to help visualize and and plan. But mm -hmm. good overview. Jim. Yeah. Yeah. A great, uh, great overview. Thanks. I appreciate it. I mean, if you have specific questions or you want to try it, you need to download, you have questions, you can reach out to me. I'm happy to help. Or I'm, I'm going to be at the club Saturday. I'm the key holder. So it's supposed to be cloudy, which it's been every time I've been the key holder. But um, if you want to come out and talk astronomy, you want to, you know, talk about Nina, we can, we can look at it and show it to you. Hey, so let Jim, me know ahead of time. Great. Just one quick question. Yes. When you, when you set up a mosaic, yes. does it let you, is each panel a separate sequence? Meaning, or can, can you rotate between the uh, panels? Uh, no, the panels are all connected together for as like, like one image. However, um, what it shows up in the sequencer is each panel. Each one is a separate, separate sequence, okay. It's a separate. So it's, it's exactly like SGP. I think that's the one of the drawbacks I've seen SGP is you know, know, you typically don't finish a whole panel in a night, so you end up with different moon faces, and then later you're trying to stitch yeah. them, dealing with noise, you know, difference yeah. in all, all frames and stuff. That's that's that, actually it, what happened to me when I did that North American Nebula. I got the first three panels done the first night, and I had to finish the fourth the next day. But what I was able to do was reload the sequence because I saved it as a file, and when I um, when I when I I reloaded it when I started again. I just I started it with the the panel that I needed to start. Okay. And Gabe, does Voyager let you do that? Like rotate between sequences? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Um, I haven't done sequences that way, but um, yeah, I think it does. I guess I I don't know why you would want to rotate a panel individually from the others. If you're doing a mosaic. No, no, when I say rotate, I'm, I'm talking about, sorry, I, I meant not do sequential, finish the entire panel before moving on to the next one. Instead, do like HA in one panel. Oh, yeah, you can. Go to HA in the next panel. No, you, you actually, you can do that. You can you can tell it to do that. That's that loop option at the top of the sequence settings. So, um, so I think SGP, what it does is if you create like a two panel mosaic, it'll be two different sequences labeled as dash one, dash two. And which in each of the panel you would have like all the filters. You can rotate between the filters within a sequence, but you can't rotate between two sequences back and forth. Yeah. So you see what I'm go, saying? in in the simple sequencer here, let me just share my screen again. In this simple sequencer, there is that um, sequence mode. If I tell it to loop. It'll, it'll, it'll loop after whatever you tell it to. So if you could do two of these and two of these and two of these and no loop. Actually, you know what, it won't, it won't go between objects. 
So if I'm in this uh, framing wizard, and I'm just going to real quick do this. So let me just go on. If you do a mosaic, it'll be each to two different objects. It's two panels, correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do this. Too. Yeah, I'm going to do so it I think it's similar two. to SVP. Add yeah. the sequence, simple sequence. Now here's how it shows up, right? So yeah, I had one there already, but it shows up as four different objects. And the way it'll work is it'll do this one first, then this and one, then, then the next. Then yeah. One. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In Voyager, you you can cycle through targets, Correct. cycle through sequences uh, as needed. So no, you can okay. do like one hour of panel one and then two Because I think that might give more uniformity yeah. between the panels, right? You end up acquiring them the same night, same moon phase and all that stuff. No, actually, this is the basic sequencer. If you go to that advanced sequencer, you could tell it, yeah. do an hour on this, then do an hour of this, then an hour of this, or do five of these, then five of these, then five of these then five of these, and then come back and do five more. Come back you and could, do this, okay. You could do that in the advanced sequencer because that's very, very customizable. Yeah, I think the advanced sequencer is uh, very similar to what Voyager has for drag script. Very similar. It allows you to program almost anything you want, which yep. is really nice. Interesting. Um, it's really nice to have that option for um, software that is freely available. I mean, considering yeah. how different things were 10, 20 years ago in terms of the software available. The, the other we have thing, something like this that is completely free and, and yeah. it's pretty amazing. The, the, other, the other thing that I'll tell you about it, you know, a lot of people are nervous about, well, it's freeware, what's going to happen with it. Nina's been around for six or seven years. It really got popular about three years ago, uh, but it's been around for a while. And there is an option to support the developer. Uh, you give them money if you want to. I, I've done that because I use it a lot. And I think it's a great tool, but the people that develop it are really good. There's a guy on uh, YouTube called Quiv the Lazy Geek. That's his name on YouTube. But he's done a lot of the development on like the focusers and things like that. And when I first got my focuser set up, I was having issues. And when I posted on Facebook, hey, I'm having this problem. He responded to me and said, hey, what are you using? And I told him, he just, oh, I know exactly what your problem is. Do this, 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 and that, and try here. And, you know, it fixed my problem and I was off and running. So um, the guys that are involved in the development in Nina are involved in the support sites and in the different groups that are out there. And they're very accessible and very open to helping. And, you know, it's, it's changing constantly. There's, you know, the new nightlies come out every couple of days with the system. So the people are always adding new functionality. Gabe, you're a programmer. You could program stuff you want into Nina and just add it. You know, and, and if it's good enough, they'll make it part of the official release. Mm -hmm. So it is pretty well put together. So Jim, how, how long have you been using Nina? Uh, about two years. Ah, okay. Yeah, I, yeah I've, I've discovered there's a, there's a very, very steep learning curve because uh, uh, you're, not, you're not using it all that often because of our mm -hmm. wonderful skies here in Wisconsin. Right. Um, but uh, I, you know, I've been you know, about 45 days now, or well, 60 days, because my license, my trial just expired, and I actually had to buy it. Uh, but even after 60 days, I, you know, I still feel like I'm only about 10% on the learning curve. Yeah, the thing I like about it is you, you can, you can use it just real simply. You know, I was, I was using it with just the DSLR and just doing straight up images. You know, no autofocus, none of that other stuff. And you know, as I got more equipment, Nina grew with me. Right. When I got my when I got my CMOS camera, I was able to start using it. I started out using Backyard EOS. You know, that was my first tool. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's sort of what I was going to ask. Was uh, you know, there's a lot of you know, like backend configuration stuff, but if you can do a lot of stuff just off the defaults, that might not be so bad for. Yeah, getting started you can on. literally plug a scope and a DSLR to this and nothing else and just do manual focus. And you know, you can even manually point the scope. You know, if you're not doing guiding and, and that sort of thing, you can do that. You don't have to have all that, all the all the sexy stuff to make it work. Any other questions? That was very good. Very nice, Jim. Good job. Thanks. I appreciate it, guys. You set, you, you set a pretty high bar for me. 
<laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure I'm sure your your presentation will be much more polished, Professor. Oh, you know, this, was, this was just a guy talking about his tool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it, guys. Um, any any other questions or anything else people want to talk about tonight? I was curious about the uh, one gigabyte download that you mentioned earlier. Is that um, just the thumbnails of the objects that are stored or is that yeah. the all sky thing that you can nope. use in order to do the framing and so on no it's just it's just thumbnails of the objects for the sky catalog for the offline sky atlas um like i said most of most of the, i've only used it once or twice i generally do my planning ahead of time and just save all the files and then load them when i get to the field i'm going to the nebraska star party this year I'll spend the week before creating sequence files for everything I want to image while I'm out there. And when I'm out there, I'll just load them. I, I'm not going to mess around doing that out there unless something comes up that I want to image that I didn't think about, you know, while I'm during the day. And actually to answer your question, Gabe, I see you asked, does ASTAP have an all sky solve fallback? Um, yes, it does. You can use the all sky plate solver in Nina as your uh, backup plate solver if ASTAP failed. But if it's configured pre correctly, I've never had ASTAP fail on me. Nice. 